I just want you guys to be hungry for Jesus, hungry for the Lord, hungry for the word. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I want you to know Jesus loves you. Okay. I want you to know Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. See, I'm trying to be all sweet to you before I preach. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God, you're so good. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, Jesus. Oh, Lord God, I praise you, Jesus. I worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know, church, what's happening lately, but I, I have been feeling the presence and power of God. I don't know. Hallelujah. Oh, I give you praise. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, you're so good, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord is so precious. I have been sensing his power and his presence in a new way, in a special way, I think more so than I've ever felt in my life. I don't know what God's, exactly what he's doing, what he's getting ready to do, or maybe he's doing it. I don't know, but I tell you, church, we don't want to miss it. The services, the preaching, the teaching, the word of God and what the Lord is doing, it's been just amazing. Uh, I, I'm telling you that if we're not careful, Jesus can be walking through right now and we're not, we're not asking him to stay. We're not asking God to stay. We're not, we're not, we're not seeking God. We're not, we're not asking him. We're, we're, we're not like Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord and saying, bless me, bless me. You know, God, I need you. I, I need your presence. I need you. Hallelujah. We... What happens is we preach last Sunday, we forget all about what was preached now, and we want something new, but we haven't done what last Sunday said. You know, we, we, we're going to be careful about that. And, and, and I remember when I was growing up and my mama, and uh, she'd fix dinner, and, and if I, I said, I want something. After I ate dinner, you she'd say, I'd say, Mama, I want something else. And she said, you finish what you got on your plate first, then I'll give you something else. That's the way I grew up. Anybody else grow up like that? You finish what's on your plate. You finish all there, and then I'll give you something else. I feel like sometimes that God's saying to us, hey, man, take what I've given you before and apply it in your life, amen, and then I'll give you something else. Well, I'm going to give you something else today, but I'm telling you, we got to take a hold of this before it's too late. Amen. Eternity is forever, folks. Eternity is forever. Heaven is forever. Hell is forever. Amen. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21. And let's go to verse 12. Matthew 21 and verse 12. Uh, I'm glad you're here today. Amen. I hope you're glad you're here today. Matthew 21, praise God. Verse 12, I'll read a few verses here. Hallelujah. Praise God. New paragraph here. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Not many people like to talk about that kind of Jesus. <laughs> but he did. He went in there and he saw what was going on in church and it displeased him and he turned over the money tables. You understand? Money scattered out everywhere. He had a, John said he had a cat, cat of nine tails, if you will. He, he had, a, had a whip, if you will. Uh, and he used that in verse 13 and said unto them, it is written, he goes to the word of God, my house shall be called the house of prayer but ye have made it a den of thieves. And then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Mm. Oh, I pray that you'll open your heart to God today. 
restoring the temple of God. Father, I pray for your blessing, your help, to minister thy word. I feel your presence, God. I pray for the unction of the Lord. May nothing come out of these lips of clay that are not of you. God, I need you, and I pray your blessing, your help, God, that you would be lifted up and glorified and that the hearts of men, of people, would be drawn unto you, God, I pray. God, you're stirring hearts. If it's not in, in, even in Mary, and I, I know, God, it's in other places, God, and you're drawing people unto you, and I thank you, God, and I pray today, Father, for the blessing of God upon the people, and God, that you would change us, help us, strengthen us. God, do some work in our hearts and lives today. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen and amen, and you may be seated, uh, restoring the, the temple of God, and you kind of got a picture there that I found uh, that kind of give you an idea. You see a whip in his hand, and he's turning over the table of the money changers because that was not uh, pleasing un unto God. See, Jesus is interested in restoring that which is to be used uh, for the intended purpose of God. Uh, that's right. Let me say it again. Jesus wants to restore back what's intended uh, purpose for God. Uh, whenever we see a true move of God, God or revival. It always restores it to its intended purpose. In this particular event, Jesus comes to restore the temple. He comes to restore the church, the place which was intended for prayer and the place of worship. But through the years, the people began to use the temple or the church for things other than what God had purposed for it. But when Jesus shows up, he restores it. See, the church of God today needs to be restored. The function of God's church needs to be restored today, church. Just before Jesus enters the temple, we see that he's riding into Jerusalem on a colt, which no man ever sat upon. And Jesus comes into the great city with meekness. He comes in humility. Picture this, if you will. Thousands had lined the roadway for Jesus' triumphal entry. And Jesus rode along with people shouting praises unto God saying Hosanna to the son of David blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest it was a messianic shout unto praise unto God Jesus the son of God he is the coming redeemer as people were shouting unto the Lord now the city of Jerusalem the center of the nation the religious capital of the world is all stirred up because of this. In other words, it's moved, if you will. In fact, notice in verse 10 of Matthew 21, and when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved to saying, who is this? Notice uh, the Bible says that the city was moved. What does that mean? Well, the word moved in the Greek is this. It is esaste, and the root word is seo, and it means or sio, and it means to rock. It means to uh, shake. It, it means to stir, but it also means uh, to agitate. And the word also means uh, earthquake or tempest or to cause to tremble with fear. And from this word, we derive our English word, which is seismic. Say that word, seismic. That's the word. You see the same word used in Matthew 27 and verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And notice this. And what happened? But the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep uh, were raised. Can you imagine when Jesus died uh, on the cross and the, the veil was written to uh, and all of a sudden the graves of the dead opened up and there are people that were once dead that are walking around the streets uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, I'd say, my beloved, that's pretty seismic. Uh, I would say that would be a stirring. Uh, I, would, I would say that'd be a moving. Uh, but when Jesus came into the great city of Jerusalem, which was the religious capital uh, of the world, uh, it wasn't a physical temple that took place, but one of a different nature, a 
all together and some of the people were really stirred or they were moved by this it really shook them up let me say this that when Jesus comes back again for the second time men's hearts will fail them for fear he's coming and will be seismic in fact in the book of Joel and chapter 2 and verse 1 look at this blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand you see the day of the Lord is coming and it will be seismic when God comes it will be huge it'll be magnificent it'll be seismic and it'll cause many to tremble and to fear within their hearts an awesome encounter with God and how awesome is our God great and mighty is he in fact in Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 14 the great day of the Lord is near it is near and hastens notice this quickly the noise of the day of the Lord is bitter there, there the mighty men shall cry out that day is a day of wrath a day of trouble and distress a day of devastation and desolation a day of darkness and gloominess a day of clouds and thick darkness and I promise you this day will be seismic like never before and that day is coming and it is coming soon and for those who have rebelled against God it will be a terrible day for them but for those that are saved like you and I it will be a day of rejoicing and there are those today who may laugh and they might scoff and they might mock and sneer at our Lord Jesus Christ but there'll be a day listen to me church I said there'll be a day when the Lord will come in might and power and majesty and glory the Bible does not lie Jesus is coming hallelujah amen, amen. and I pray that there would be a stirring in your heart today Mm. Now listen, my beloved, he may have ridden into Jerusalem the first time on a colt, but next time he'll, he comes, it'll be on a white horse, and he will come, and the Bible said his eyes will be like a flame of fire and a robe dipped in blood, and at his mouth will be a short, sharp sword, and on his robe and thigh will be written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, hallelujah, regardless of what goes on past, present, or future, it may men be assured that Jesus will have the last word. You can tease and mock and sneer at us, the saints of God, but I'm telling you, God has the last word word he will prevail and triumph over the powers of darkness and the darkness of man's wicked schemes because Jesus Christ is Lord and you and I have the victory in him amen yeah. hallelujah and I pray that what was just said would cause a moving or a stirring in your heart yeah. hallelujah amen hallelujah because truth that is preached should resonate with the spirit of truth that is within your heart. Amen. 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 Now, now as, as Jesus approaches the city in the midst of shouts and praises, notice that he goes directly to the center of the city. He goes to the temple. In other words, he went to church. I'm sure that there were a lot of things he passed by that needed his attention. He probably saw the injustice of the poor. He probably saw the condition of the people and the government needed an overhaul just like the government needs an overhaul today. However, Jesus passes by those things and he heads directly to the temple. He didn't stop to McDonald's and get a Diet Coke. He didn't go to Burger King. He didn't even stop by the coffee shop, although you can't stop by the coffee shop, the remnant, by the way. Uh, he didn't even stop by there to get a cup of coffee but he heads straight to the temple he went straight to the church I know people don't you think that Jesus cares oh yes I mean with all the sin and the problems within this city with all its crimes and immorality with all the abuse and the troubles and the problems today doesn't Jesus care about these things isn't he concerned about it my friend doesn't these things matter to him well of course they do but listen to what I have to say today as long as the church is not right we can never expect the city to be right Amen. hallelujah 
In fact, the reason our cities and our states and our communities and our nation is in the mess it's in today is because of the condition of the temple, the condition of the church. And I'm not talking about just the physical structure of a building, but I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about the temple. I mean, we spend a lot of time trying to correct the world when the church needs cleansing. We have a, a, a come on, church, you got to help me preach this here today. I mean, Jesus said, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Now, this explains the setting, this explains the situation. We first must give our dire attention on the condition of the church, the condition of the temple, the condition of the heart, the condition of the Christian. You know, the book of Revelation, two chapters are completely devoted to the correcting of the church. Jesus said, you've left your first love. You're, like, you're lukewarm. I'll spill you out of my mouth. He said, you teach false doctrine in the church. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Jesus corrects the church. Peter said, for the time has come, for judgment begins in the house of God. The temple must be cleansed before we can deal with other things. We first must deal with the church, with the heart, with this temple. See, as long as the church is not right, we can never expect this city to be right. And if the pulpit is not right, then how can we expect the rest of it to be right? All corruption must be cleansed out of the temple. <laughs> you see, I know, church, we're living in very peculiar times. Uh, come on, help me now. Uh, oh, Lord God, where's the hunger for God? Yes. No, church, don't listen to me. Where is it? Uh, there's a time when churches like this be packed out, people hungry for God, hungry for more. At that old-fashioned altar, praying and seeking God, fasting, desiring God, praising and worshiping the Lord, wanting more of God, weeping at that altar, grabbing the horns of the altar, saying, I want God, I want the Lord like the bread. <laughs> Amen, off the master, off the, the table of the master's table. The crumbs are okay with me. I just want Jesus. I just want God. I want the Lord. I Just give me more of him. Hallelujah. What's happened today? Why the apathy? Why the passiveness? Why the lack of hunger? Why the lack of thirst? What's going on today? I'll tell you, that world's trying to drown you out and it's trying to fill the places in this temple that don't belong there. I said they don't belong there. And Jesus is trying to turn over the tables in your life, in your heart. He's trying to change some things. I know we're in peculiar times and this is what's going on today. You might not agree with me. That's okay. I love you. I'll kiss you. You kiss me. We love one another and we'll embrace and hug. But my Money now governs the decisions of many churches today. Politics is in the church today. I said politics governs and leads and guides and directs the church rather than the power of the Holy Ghost. Call me loony. Call me crazy. God wanted us to start an independent Pentecostal church. Why? Because God is our politics. God is our governor. God is our king. God is our Lord. God is our guide. He's the one that calls the shots. We want to obey the Lord. Hallelujah. Not politics, not man, but God. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hear me here. Don't let me lose you. Because if I lose you, when everybody else goes, you got to stand and preach it again. <laughs> you got to listen to it again. And what I'm saying, money now governs the decisions of churches. Uh, Eli has not corrected his sons. Uh, they are thieves and uh, corruptors, uh, and yet they're handling, handling the sacrifices of God. Uh, you have thieves and corruptors that are handling the spiritual things of God. Uh, be Eli, the high priest, won't do anything about it. Uh, he just lets things go. Uh, he doesn't deal with the issue, and that needs to be dealt with. Uh, he probably is afraid of offending people and running people out the church doors or uh, uh, running out the tithe check. Uh, but listen, my beloved, whether you agree with me or not I find that famine has hit the church and so it goes to Egypt for help which is a type of the world and in an attempt to save its skin the church now markets itself to the unchurched in hopes that it'll bring in good numbers of people and cash in other words we're getting the idea from the world and bringing it into the church and thereby keeping them on the cutting edge of the modern hip hop popular social gathering of what now we call the church but it's more fleshly than ever. It's more carnal than ever. There's no spirit. There's no power. There's no life. There's no deliverance. There's no salvation. Come on, church. I'm telling you, there's no moving of the Holy Ghost. Huh. Church leadership will have to answer to God for much of the suffering and the pain 
caused by their misuse and abuse and lying and false doctrine and shearing of the sheep, uh, which is all done, of course, in the name of blessing and in the name of God told me so. And I said all that to say this, the temple needs to be cleansed. There needs to be revival. There needs to be a renewing. There needs to be a power of thy spirit to work and to move in the church like never before. And the only way to have world impact is for the temple to be rid of all that which displeases God. The temple was the first to experience uh, the impact. Uh, you see, in fact, the impact uh, was so great that a few things happened here. What happened when Jesus showed up in the temple? Well, number one is this. Uh, the marketers were ushered out. Uh, verse 12, Matthew 21. Uh, and Jesus, when he went to church, uh, when he went in the heart, uh, when he went in the temple of God uh, and cast out all them uh, that sold and bought in the temple, uh, they were driven out for a purpose. Uh, what was the purpose. They had made the temple of God into something it was never intended for it to be. I mean, you got you to gotta get out what doesn't belong to God and allow in what does belong to God. You see, the temple was never meant to be an ecumenical tool to unite all religions. Uh-uh. Hey, man, that's not how, uh-uh. uh-uh. No, it's just not Unitarianism. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. How can we do that when we can't agree on doctrine, especially the doctrine of justification by faith? The church was never intended to be a place where the unchurched dictated or the lost dictated what was to happen. In other words, there is no reverse mentoring here. Listen to this. It was never intended to be a place of entertainment or show. It's to be this. Jesus said, my father's house is to be a house of what? Hear me, church. A house of what? A house of prayer. That's right. He said that's what's its intended purpose. That's what it's there for, to be a house of prayer. Now get this. When our Lord entered into Jerusalem, he didn't go up to the palace of the king, nor did he go to the courts of the rulers, nor did he go to the high priest of Caiaphas. He wasn't coming to the pope, but rather Jesus went to the temple. In other words, when he got into town, he went to church. He went to the house of God. Jesus went there first. Mm. Oh, you understand what God's trying to do? You're trying to deal with everybody else when you first need to be dealt with. Oh, 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 no, no, pastor. Wait, wait, what are you talking about? I'm talking about you got to get the log out of your eye before you try to get the splinter out of mine. Mm, hallelujah. Somebody hear me preach. Somebody hear this. <laughs> hallelujah. We're trying to deal with all the problems when the church got to be dealt with first. The church is you. It's not the structure of this building. It's you. You're the church. You're the one that's saved. You're the one that's... I'm so glad that y'all here today. Amen. I'll be glad to get the other half back because we miss them. But I tell you what, I'm so glad to have you here today. God bless you. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, God wants to deal with this right here. God wants to deal with me. God wants to change me. God wants to remove some things out of my heart and life in the temple that don't belong to God. God, things like greed, things like pride, things like selfishness, all things of the flesh he wants to get rid of. So he comes into Jerusalem, the, the capital city of the nation, and he goes right to the temple. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see, his kingdom, now get this now, I know we can get caught up in things. I do too. I got to watch myself. I get caught up in politics. I get caught up in what's happening to this nation. And I feel for this nation. I grieve for this nation. I get caught up in a lot of things. But God's kingdom was not of this world. I'm trying to tell you, listen, church, this isn't our, this is in our world. This is in our kingdom. It's not of this world. This is not the kingdom of God. It's not physical, but his kingdom is heavenly and spiritual. His authority and rule was in the temple of God and in the hearts of men in the hearts of men. Therefore, he went up to the temple of God to what? To do this, to cleanse it and to show men how the temple was to be used. Amen. What's this temple to be used for? 
It's not to be used for the flesh, but that this temple is to be used for the glory of God. Your purpose is to glorify God in your life, in your actions, in your living, in the way you live. Your testimony is to bring glory unto God. Your worship, your prayer, your singing, your praise is to bring glory unto God. Your faithfulness, your commitment, your actions are to bring glory unto God. I wish somebody hear me today. temple had to be cleansed you see thieves marketers are in there now and the temple is not to be a place where people are exploited verse 12 tells us that the temple is a, a house of prayer verse 13 tells us that the temple is to be a place of ministry verse 14 the temple is to be a place where wonderful things are done and miracles take place. Verse 15, the temple is to be a place where Christ is praised. Verse 15 and 16, and how far removed from that purpose is the postmodern church of today. We now make the house of worship a place of entertainment, jokes, and sports. You see, I, I want you to See, everybody, we're going to have Super Bowl night. Everybody put on your jersey for your favorite team, and, and you, we're going to have the big screen TV, and we're going to have Super Bowl party night on a Sunday night service. I tell you the truth, I not lie. We have seen this. We, I tell you the truth. We have made it into something God never intended it to be. Uh, there was a time, I don't know if they still do it, but the sanctuary, they made it and can convert it into a basketball court. Uh, on certain days, it's a basketball court. Uh, Bible says reverence in Leviticus, my sanctuary. You don't want to confuse the kids. Uh, confuse the kids. Well, is this worship night or basketball night? What are you talking about? No, when you walk here, you know there's a distinction. You know that there's something different. We're in the house of worship. Uh, we're in a place and a consecration created area where it's holy ground where the saints gather together and they worship God where two or three gather together there I am in the midst of them there is a distinction of the house of the Lord and the house of worship you might not agree but I understand we can disagree but still love one another but I see this happening today oh we've lost the intended purpose of the church the YMCA Young Men's Christian Association used to be a place where men gathered together and worship God and praised his holy name in the 1800s D.L. Moody he went to England and he went to the YMCA and when he got there the place was hot on fire men, uh, men praising God magnifying the Lord speaking in other tongues as the spirit of God was in that house but now it's a gym I said now it's a gym listen you can have a workout club if you want to but it's no longer young men's Christian association it's a workout club and if the church doesn't get the Holy Ghost if we don't have revival if we don't have a move of God we're going to end up the same way in our hearts we will desire things rather than him we will want things rather than him other things will take interest but not him other things will captivate our hearts but not him I'm afraid that we become lax with God and we've, therefore we've lost our impact. You know it's true. Over the decades, the impact of the church has softened, church. Listen, it has softened. It's to where there's hardly any impact at all. No shaking, no moving to such the degree that the world feels right at home in the church. In other words, we've become like them. And many churches these days stay away from controversial issues like sin. They stay away from homosexuality, judgment, repentance, change. They quit preaching things like the blood and atonement and the cross and redemption. And now we tell them that we accept their lifestyle and they don't have to change. God accepts you just as you are. That is false. That's not true. You must be saved. You must be born again. It's a narrow way. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. And there be many who go in by it. Narrows the way that leads to life. And 
there be few that find it. No wonder the world comes in and feels right at home. No conviction. No challenge to the respond to the word. No change. Basically, they feel they can stay the way they are and still make it to heaven. Just attach Jesus to your life and he'll make you feel better. That is false teaching. Give us preachers today that will declare the word of God in love and bring conviction back in the church again in the word of God to deal with the hearts of man and to clean the temple out. God, God help us. The early church was so full of God and so full of the Holy Ghost that they caused an impact wherever they went. And their message was so controversial that it caused a disturbance. I, I mean, the earth shook when they prayed. Shackles would fall loose. Jail cell doors would bust open. The lost came under conviction with their inspired preaching. Thousands would be saved. And while fear gripped their hearts of conviction, the sick would be healed. The dead would be raised to life again. That's the ministry of the church. That's the function of the body of Christ like you and I. What I'm saying is that the ministry of the early church was seismic. It was earth shattering. Persecution came to the early church, not because of lack, but because of their fullness. They were full of God, full of the Holy Ghost, full of the word. Nothing could stop them, nothing. Oh, Jesus, have your rightful place in this temple and do what you need to do with it, amen. Hallelujah. But secondly, what happens when Jesus shows up in the temple? The blind, the lame, and the children were ushered in. Notice this. Notice this. This is so cool. Matthew 21, 14. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Hallelujah. Jesus is there. Look at verse 15 tells us the children were doing this. They were crying out in the temple, singing, Hosanna to the son of David. Listen to this. The children, the children were praising God, getting up at six in the morning so they can go to church. You know, <laughs> look at this. Look at this. This is so cool. The religious, of course, were angry about this. The religious were angry. They didn't like that song. Y'all not hearing me. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. And they got angry at the children that were singing praises unto God. Why would they be angry about cleaning out the temple? Because it messed up their money making profits. It was big business. The church had become big business. We left the purpose of God for the church and now the church has become a marketing business. Big business. Money making business. This is what happens when we drift away from God. This is what happens when, when man gets in it. This is what happens when you no longer have the spirit and the presence and the anointing of God. It's all about money. Power. Prestige. Image. You see the temple sat, let me, let, me, let me show you something, let me teach you something here. The temple sat on top of Mount Zion and was thought to have ordered, uh, covered about 30 acres of land. Now it consisted of two parts, the temple. There was the temple building. You just keep that picture right there, Brother John. You see the temple building. And then there was the temple courtyards around the building. And the temple building was a small structure which sat in the center of the temple property. It was called the holy place or the holy of holies. And so only the high priest could enter into its walls once a year on the day of atonement, make an offering or sacrifice on behalf of himself and then also for the people of Israel. And the four courtyards which surrounded the temple were separated by huge walls. And you can see those huge walls in that picture. First, uh, there was the inner court of the priest. Only the priests were allowed to enter into this court. Within the courtyard stood the great furnishings of worship. For instance, they had the altar of burnt offerings where they offered sacrifices, animals unto God on behalf of their sins. The brazen laver, the seven-branched lampstand, uh, the altar of incense which signifies prayers unto God, the table of showbread, all of which speaks of Jesus Christ. Christ, our Lord and our Savior, hallelujah, as he is the bread of life and he feeds me, praise God. But secondly was the court of the Israelites. 
And this was a huge courtyard where Jewish worshipers met together for joint services on great feast days. It was also the place where worshipers handed over their sacrifices to the priest. But thirdly was the court of the women. And women were usually limited to this area except for worship. But then fourthly, we had the court of the Gentiles. And this courtyard was the place that was farthest removed from the center of worship. And it was in this court of the Gentiles where so much commercialism took place. And there are regular commercial markets within its walls. And you wonder how did a commercial or commercial market ever get into the temple of God? It's very simple. It's because of greed. The love for money, the love for wealth, the love for power, and the love for control. Why should those people out there get the money and business when we can get the business in the church? We can have it for ourselves. And so let's implement their ideas and let's bring them into the house of God. Mm hmm. You see, worshipers needed items for their sacrifices and offerings, and people from foreign nations also needed money exchanged. And at some point in the history of the temple, instead of letting retailers on the outside reap all the profits, the priest had decided, that's the, the spiritual leadership, had decided to take advantage of the market themselves. And so the priest began to set up booths within the court of the Gentiles. And they also leased out spaces to outside retailers, and the courtyard was filled with booth-like spaces where people can find any kind of service that they needed and the atmosphere was one of commercial traffic and of commotion but nothing of worship nothing of prayer nothing but carnality and of flesh no spirituality whatsoever they were not concerned about that they can care less about that just give me your dough Now, they were in the temple, but the temple wasn't in them. Amen. Somebody hear me today? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> they were misusing God, getting rich off the gospel. I mean, come on, how many personal jets does a preacher need? And how many houses does a preacher need? Come on, folks, why aren't we wise up to these things? I don't care how famous you might look. You have turned the temple of God into something that was never intended to be. Amen. Getting rich, mansions, jets, money, power, fame. Mm. That's what's happening, my beloved. Now, when Jesus shows up on the scene, now this is what he does. <laughs> he disrupts the money-making schemes and profits of the religious. Here he come. Hallelujah. Praise God. Guess what, folks? I got a special announcement. We're going to have a great service this Sunday. A special guest is coming. His name is Jesus. He's coming, and he's going to be coming to the church. And so he comes, and we're all excited. Jesus comes to the church, and he walks in the doors, and he starts turning over money tables. He starts disrupting some things. Hallelujah. And the people didn't like this too much. And the religious were more interested in making a dollar than ministering to the needs of the people. And they were more concerned about padding their pockets than meeting the needs of others. And Jesus reacted in power and cleansing judgment of God. The kind of power that will cause men to tremble before the Lord. He had to turn over that which was corrupt in order to usher in that which was right. Jesus ushers out so he can usher in. Jesus ushers out so Jesus can usher in sometimes he prunes hallelujah sometimes he removes to make room for what he wants in <laughs> y'all get that oh lord help me you guys okay all right, here we go. <laughs> Jesus, he does the same thing in our lives. Now listen to this. He ushers out 
so he can usher in. And this is what he does in our lives. Sometimes Jesus comes and turns things upside down in our lives. Sometimes Jesus enters and causes a disturbance in our midst. Why are these things happening to me? And why is it so hard? And how come everything doesn't go my way? And why the turmoil? And why the problems? And why the difficulties? And why the chaos? And sometimes Jesus comes in and he causes a disturbance. And, and you walk out of here sometimes and you say, man, Pastor Mark, he was sure preaching, wasn't he? I didn't like what he was saying. Kind of, kind of got me upset. Kind of got me angry. No, Jesus has taken that word and he's walked right over to you and he's got inside the temple and he's turning things over. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are things in the temple that don't belong there, that moved in there and you didn't even know what you were sleeping one night and some things of the world moved into your temple and tried to set up camp and a booth to sell and market things there and you didn't even realize it, but Jesus sees it and he said, my temple, my father's house is going to be a house of prayer. It belongs to God. You were made in the image of God to worship your creator, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I got to keep preaching, okay? Look at this. Now, he deals with our hearts. Listen to this. He brings conviction. Don't run from conviction. Don't run from it. But if it's there, praise God. If your preacher preaches conviction, hallelujah, praise God. Whatever preacher preaches the truth, praise God for them. Jesus causes us to search and to reflect and examine. Examine your hearts to see if you're in the faith. Bible says that he causes an unsettledness to occur what is he doing he is turning over the tables of the money changers in your life he's putting back in order the things that pertain to God he's helping us get things right on the right track he's setting things in order again for the glory of the Lord the way God wants it hallelujah we'll pray for you Holden <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> You see, what I'm trying to say is we don't even realize we're doing this. I throw myself in the basket a lot with you. We don't even know we're doing this, folks. You, 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 I got you here for, if you come to Sunday school, I got you here from 9.15. I got you here about three hours. And we're trying to minister the word God to you. And then some of you I have back on Sunday night, and we're trying to minister the word of God to you. And Wednesday I have some of you trying to minister the word of God to you. Because when you step outside that church, you have everything of the world combating God that's in your heart trying to pull, trying to, trying, trying to mess you over, trying to cause you to think like them, act like them, do like them, lose your safety and security and faith in God. And all the time, it's a war against your mind. It's constant battle in your mind. Amen. And so we're here, and, and, and sometimes we tend to misplace God for things. And we get our eyes off of Jesus and we get them on things. We get them on the material. We get them on circumstances. We get them on our feelings. And we start trusting our feelings and trusting things and trusting circumstances rather than trusting God. But thank God he comes in and turns things over. He may cause a crisis or a seismic event to take place. But listen, my beloved, Jesus knows we need things to be turned over from time to time. We need our nest to be stirred. Yes. What's the impact of Jesus turning over the tables? What's the impact of Jesus running out the marketers? Well, notice this. Those that used to not come, now come. <laughs> I love this. Get the trash out. Get the filth out. Get the world out. Get the covetousness out. Get the sin out. Get the flesh out. Get the religious out of your heart. You ever seen this before in this passage? Look at this. Now that Jesus is in the temple, it's being used for its intended purpose. He restores it back to its original function. That's what revival does. Yes. It brings back to its original use. You ever taken a car, an old beat up car, an old 57 Chevy, something like that, and you just 
and you, you restored it. And the, the one that owns the car and the one that's putting time in the car and, 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 and working on that car, in his mind, is to bring that car back to its intended purpose. In other words, he wants to revive the car. He wants to bring it back to life. He wants to bring it back for its intended use. And that's what revival does. The Spirit of God turns things over in our hearts and lives and in the church and tries to bring the church back to its intended purpose, what God wants it to be. My house should be called a house of prayer, a house of worship. Spiritual things take place in the house of God. And after Jesus turned over all the tables, the temple, it didn't look too good. I mean, it was a mess from Jesus throwing over the tables and the scattering the money all over the floor. But notice those who couldn't walk now walk. And the song has returned and worship and singing now fills the place, fills the temple. Verse 15 tells us that the children were singing in the temple hallelujah now, what are we saying I'm saying that worship is restored children are back in church today they're having problems getting the youth to come to church but when Jesus sets it straight the children come I think about on Wednesday nights and we have 50, 60, 70 kids and they keep coming back they keep coming back we're not a huge church we don't have as much to offer as other big churches might have to offer but they keep coming back and they'll call can you pick me up will you pick me up don't forget to pick me up all over the city here isn't it amazing that it happens what is it that they keep coming back for I have no explanation except they must know or sense the presence of God in the temple in the church the love of God in people that truly care about them that they'll get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to get ready for church. I got dead winter. Dead winter. You have children that missed the bus or thought they missed the bus and they'll walk here. One walked all the way from David Street to get in to not miss a Wednesday night service. In the, in the snow, in the dark. Do you see why? Do you see why we gotta get a building, folks? I know it's been tough. It's been a fight, a little bit harder of a fight than I thought. But do you see the importance? People, people have their priorities on so many other things, but they don't feel the passion, at least that this pastor feels for, for kids. They don't, they don't feel the passion. I uh, had a, a uh, young lady that graduated this year from River Valley. And she had a graduation party yesterday. And I was, Saturdays are like, I'm crushed on Saturdays. I am so busy. But in my spirit, I kept feeling, I, I need to go to this. I need to go to this. She has ridden my bus since she was in the second grade. Second grade. And I just felt like I need to go to this one. And so, uh, we got things finished up here, and I appreciate Brother Kevin helping, Michael helping to get that monitor back there and, and I took off and I, I went to this graduation party why would you do that when you have so much to do what's your purpose she doesn't go to your church what does it matter I guess I wanted her to know, number one, they know I'm a pastor. Number two, I represent the gospel. But number three, I wanted her to know that I care about you. Yes. I care about you as a person. I care about your life. I care about you. I think we as Christians can let that world know that we care we take interest you represent the kingdom of God I 
for the presence of God now is back in the temple. See, that's what will keep the kids. It's not games. It's not entertainment. It's not shows. But the presence of Almighty God, that's what will impact their lives forever. It's not your billion-dollar gold trim buildings that are going to keep people for Jesus. The question is, do they have the presence of God there? Is Jesus in your midst? Do you have the presence of the Holy Ghost? In the Philippines, in Nicaragua, in Thailand, we'd meet in some places that had wood slats for seats and dirty floors and palm branch roofs. But the presence of God was there in a powerful way. And that's all that mattered. Uh, Morgan, remember that last house we were at, a, a big storm came. People packed in this house. It was a church house in this one room. We must have had 30, 35 people in there. We're packed in there. It's hot, humid. I mean, they had one little light bulb, I think, in the middle. And I'm trying to preach off of a cardboard box that was converted into a pulpit. I mean, they're right up in front of me. Hey man, y'all back there, but I'm telling you, they're right there in front of me. And I had about two foot of space and we're preaching the gospel of Christ. The presence of God, I, I'll never forget this, the presence of God entered into that room. The, and these, these people in Nicaragua began to lift up their hands and their voices and they're praising God. And I'm preaching some of the same stuff I preach here, but they're praising God. And a storm came that night. It rained a lot there in Nicaragua and the lights went out, but that didn't stop anything. In pitch darkness, that's hot. It's humid. It's crowded. We're packed in like sardines. But they're still singing the praises of God. Hallelujah. Why did they do that? Because they recognized that God was in that place. I remember one of the churches we had preached at. And that pastor didn't know me. And I've got an interpreter. And Morgan, you'll remember this. But while I was preaching, that beautiful couple, that family... They went to get us a soft drink afterwards that we wanted to stay. And that pastor sat in the front seat of his church the entire time I was preaching. And he cried and he wept and he sobbed the whole time. Why? Because he felt the presence of God. That's why. care what the modern fashion of the church is today. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care what your hip hop popular church is doing today. I don't care. Are they preaching the gospel? Would I be allowed to preach in that church? Would Jesus be allowed to come and say what he wants? Notice this. After the money changers and marketers were kicked out, singing and worship now filled the place. Look at this. Get the church back to what its intended purpose is to be, and we will once again see the blind and the lame healed, and people will come in lost and searching, and they'll find Jesus. They won't find a money gospel. They won't find a money message, but they will find Jesus. Songs will be lifted up in his name. Praise and worship will be to exalt him. Songs of worship that point directly to Christ. It lifts up the soul to heaven and causes one to sing in adoration unto God. It's worshiping in spirit and truth. Get the church back. Get this temple back to what its intended purpose is to be. Get the temple right. And when the sick come in, they'll be healed. The eyes of the blind will be opened. The deaf will hear. The lame will walk. The captive will be set free. But isn't that what Jesus came to do? Isn't that what he, you don't have to make it complicated. Let's keep the focus. Jesus, his mission to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the mission of Christ. That's what we should be doing. And everything, that's, that's, the, that's the, the core of word of life. Can we be thankful that you have a pastor that has that at the core values of the church? Mission to preach, to win the lost, People, you have opportunity to do right with God. You have the opportunity to allow the Lord to work in your life. You have the opportunity to be used of God. 
Some will, some won't. But that's your business. My business is to do what I'm doing right now. Your business is to do what you want with that. Between you and God, you see. See, let Jesus turn over the things in your heart and life that doesn't please him. Let him restore this temple to its proper function. so that we're able to see what we've not been able to see. All the the truths that I've been missing. All because I have not allowed Jesus to turn over or to clean up or to clean out of me all that which is hindering me from being the temple that pleases him. When all that which is ungodly is cleansed out of the temple, God will then usher in his presence. His presence. What is Christianity without the presence of God? What is gathering together as a body of Christ without the presence of God? And when and and and, and when people come in, they'll sense the presence of the Lord. Maybe they don't know what it is, but they know it's something different. I just want his presence. I want the presence of God. <laughs> Oh, God, amen. Do what you got to do. God, get rid of the, whatever it is that's not pleasing to you in this heart because this is a daily thing. This is not just once in a while. This is daily. God, I want to be broken and humble before you. Take out the pride. Take out the self. Take off. Take out the religiosity, just being religious, you know. I just don't want to go through the act of performance. But I want your presence. We might not have much money. We might be between the tracks and hear the trains and the whistles of the trains. God bless those trains. We might be in an old building built in the 40s that keeps, the air conditioner keeps tripping the breaker. We, we might not have the fanciest of things, but is that what you're looking for? Is that your agenda? Is that your desire? Is that your hunger? I want, I want the best that buildings can offer. I don't want to be on the west end of town. I don't want to associate. Ah. I've got a lady that's willing to drive from Dayton to this church because she loved and felt the presence of God from Dayton. And she says, how long have you been there? Oh, we lived here 22 years. She says, how come I have never heard of you? The presence of God. That's the hunger. She's on fire for the Lord, on fire. I mean, she was talking and stirring my heart on fire for God. presence of the Lord. Folks, listen, I, I, I love you. I love you. I love you. You know I love you. But I want to see God move in you and work through you and use you for his glory and full capacity. No holding back. Let him use you. Let him, let him flow through you. Let him fill you. Let him use this congregation to make a, a, an impact and even a disturbance in the city. Oh, we have, believe me, the city writes me a letter every time some, one thing's out of place, believe me. You drive around and you got piles of trash all over different properties all over the city but oh no word of life gets the letter what does that mean they're watching us is what it means Amen. I'm sorry make an impact in you in you so my prayer would be this God turn over the money tables in my heart so that I, my heart might be Greatly more filled with your presence. Let's stand together, please. Hallelujah. Abby, if you'd come, I appreciate it so much. 
Oh God, I, I want to be filled with your presence. I need Jesus to enter in. And I, I want to look at this in a twofold way. Number one, he can enter into the very church, like physical church that we see here today. But and we can call this, in a sense, an analogy, a temple, I guess. It's a place of worship. We want things to be done decently in order. But yet at the same time, we do want the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit and the freedom to worship, the freedom to pray. Thank God we have altars. Thank God we have the opportunity to pray, but I want God to work in this temple. I know I need God to work in this temple. Hallelujah. And if you're one of those today with every eye closed, every head bowed, and, and you would just simply raise your hand. If you're one of those that says, Pastor Mark, I want God to work in this temple. Thank you. Just raise your hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know you do. I know you love the Lord. And why don't we do this? Why don't we ask the Lord to move in this temple, turn over whatever he wants to turn over, and let's deal with that so that he can fill this temple with his presence. Let him fill your heart. Let him do that. Hallelujah. Let there be, be a seismic moving in your heart. Let God work. Let God stir. Let God tug and touch and move and feel. Let Jesus do what he wants in our in this temple. Hallelujah. And I'm just going to ask you today to find a place to pray. I'm going to invite you to this altar. Just come and just find a place to pray this morning. Come on, church. It's okay. You raise your hand. Come, find a place to pray. God, I pray in the name of the Lord. Turn over the money tables. Whatever it is, God, maybe there's pride, and religion, whatever. I don't know. It's between you and God. Maybe my attitude isn't right. Maybe, maybe there's something disturbing me. Maybe there's something not right. Whatever it is, I invite you. I invite you to come to Jesus. Just come to Christ. Come to God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. God, do it in my heart. Do it in my life. In this temple, God. I pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you, God, to fill this temple with your presence and with your glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. God, do this work in this temple, God, I pray. Hallelujah. Make room for Jesus. Hallelujah. You get this temple right with God. He'll use you to pray for the sick, to pray for the lost, to win people to Christ. To see people healed by the power of God. I pray in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, just find a place. I pray in the name of Jesus. I want none of that world in this temple, God. Lord, turn over the money tables. Do what you need to do. But God, have your way and fill it with your presence. And use this temple for your glory, God, I pray. Hallelujah. In God good. In God good, in the Lord good, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I thank you, Lord. I praise you. I worship you. God, my God, here I am. I pour my heart out to you, Lord. I'm willing, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing, God. Change me, God. Change me, Lord. I'm willing, God. I pray, change me, oh God. Change me, oh God. Oh, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. My Lord, I pray right now, Father God. Jesus, oh Lord, I pray. 
In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, oh God, oh God, do this work, God, and fill this temple with your presence, I pray, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus, fill this temple, Lord. Hallelujah with your presence, that you might use it for your glory. Use it for your glory, God, I pray. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, oh Lord, I pray. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus, God, hallelujah. And God can use his church to pray for the sick, that they might be healed. Hallelujah. Oh, God, even to raise the dead, greater works than these you shall do, Jesus said. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. God, use this church, your people. Use it, God. Use it the body of Christ, this temple, and this heart, and this life. Lord, remove, I pray, anything that would hinder your presence in my life, hinder you from having your way and using this temple for your glory, God. Remove the flesh, carnality, self, sin, and when God fills the temple with his presence, causes us to want to minister to others, to sing unto God in worship and adoration in spirit and truth, it causes us to desire him even more. I just desire the Lord. I desire God in my heart, my life. Hallelujah. His presence is what makes the difference. I must have Christ. I must have the Lord. The Lord, I believe, is coming. I believe the days are shortened. I believe he's coming soon. We must be ready. Be ready for the coming of Christ. Be ready for a moving of the Spirit of God. I pray, God, that every person in this place would have the victory of the Lord. Those watching live have victory of God. I pray that God, that you would walk in the temple of their heart. God, take out whatever is not pleasing to you. Remove that which hinders the presence of God and from the spirit of the Lord moving. Remove it, God, and usher in your presence. Hallelujah. Can you imagine praying for the sick and being healed, the lost being saved, the bound being delivered because the church believes Christ is in his rightful place. There's nothing distracting us from God or pulling us away from God or calling, causing our senses to be dulled to where Christ can be right in front of us and we not see him. He can be walking right through this body of Christ and we can miss him because of the lack of alertness and awareness spiritually. Oh God, may we be sober and vigilant. God, I pray. Praise God, oh Lord, give you praise and adoration today.
Yes. Pray. Yes. And honor me and glorify me and take me as I am at my word. Yes, Lord. My word will satisfy you. Amen. Yes. 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 Wake up my children. Wake up my children. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. There's more. Amen. Hallelujah. God, stir our hearts. Stir us, oh God. May there be a seismic move of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together, please. Pray as long as you would like. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your presence. I thank you for the word of the Lord and God. Your, anointing and your unction and once I sense in this place I feel your strength I feel your nearness I, 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 I feel like you're right here next to me preaching this word and I thank you Lord I thank you God for who you are but Lord I just I'm thankful that there's more God to attain forgetting those things which are behind and pressing on to those things which are ahead I pray that every one of us would be stirred in our hearts and God that we would do what we can to eliminate distraction and make some adjustments in our lives so that we might have more time with you. I pray that you'd cultivate a hunger, a stirring in our hearts for more of you. And I pray God that you would come into the temple, turn things over, do what you need to do so that it might be filled in a greater capacity with your presence so that you can use your people, the church, the body of Christ, to do the function the church ought to be doing, preaching the gospel, praying for the sick to be healed, raising the dead, opening up blinded eyes, bondages being broken, jail cell doors being opened, people being set free because the church is active, because Christ has its rightful place in the temple. And I thank you, Lord. God, we love you and we praise you today. And I thank you, almighty God. Hallelujah. Touch this city, Lord. Please touch this nation. Please, oh God, win the lost. Let your light go forth. Let your church be filled with your power and your anointing and of your spirit, the Holy Ghost and fire. God, I pray in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. That we'll... We'll shake off the summer blahs or the summer blues, if you will, Lord God. And I pray to be, be reignited with the fire and the passion of God, the Holy Ghost. And I thank you, Lord. God, we love and praise you as we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, church. We serve a great God. We serve a wonderful Savior. Hallelujah. And I pray that you have a wonderful and blessed day today. And please come back tonight for our 6.30 service. And uh, I, I just want to say, if you want to come a little early, if you would like to spend time in prayer, you're more than welcome to do that. I'll have the doors open by 5.45, but you're more than welcome to come and to spend some time in prayer here. Or one of the side rooms, you can pray in there as well. That's fine. That's great. Okay. Tell somebody you love them, you appreciate them, thankful for you, my brother and sister in Christ, and have a wonderful day today. Hallelujah. God bless you.